Viewer discretion is advised. Somewhere in Salem, Oregon, 1988. It was raining, but only gently. The sound of it falling on her umbrella no more than a soothing pitter-patter. This is a pretty little neighborhood, don't you think? Icky asked as she strolled down the sidewalk, the violet coloring of her face subdued to avoid drawing notice to her bosomorphic nature. It's still humdrum territory. Don't get too comfortable. Manny adjusted his scarf and hat to hide his upside down face. They turned a corner and came upon a small park with a lone girl running along the play equipment, talking to herself in a loud, pontificating voice. At first, Icky thought it was odd that the girl was playing in the rain, but then realized that it wasn't raining inside of the park. That's her. I'll let you take the lead. Hello, everybody. I'm The Rubber. Today, we bring you a tale from the SCP Foundation. The two of them walked towards the front gates and saw that they were locked. A sign had been hung reading, Royal Kingdom of Queen Sophie, go away. The inside of the park was littered with countless toys and candy wrappers, buoyant balloons that bobbed up and down, and a fountain full of chocolate milk. Icky cleared her throat and said, Excuse me, may we speak with Queen Sophie, please? Who dares intrude upon the greatest sorcerer queen in all the land? The girl demanded, marching towards the entrance with a plastic staff in hand. She was a redhead, maybe about eight years old, and looked like she hadn't had a bath for some time. Her sparkling tutu and Care Bears t-shirt were covered in dirt and chocolate. Just a humble circus performer, your majesty, and her companion. Icky replied with a polite curtsy. You'll kneel if you don't wish to face my wrath. Icky humored her without hesitation, but Manny was a tad more reluctant. I said kneel, foreigner. Icky gave Manny a stern look. Get on your knees, idiot. She mouthed to him, barely managing her smile. Just what we need, another high maintenance reality bender. He murmured as he dropped to one knee. Now, explain why you have interrupted my eternal playtime. Of course, your majesty. We're from a community of magical people like yourself, and I'm the only magic girl in the world. Do you really think that? Is that why you're all alone in there? Other people are scared of me. Kids, my parents, even the police and soldiers in black ran from me. It's better if I just stay here. Icky then slowly let the bright violet to return to her lips, cheeks, and eyes. I'm magic too. So is he. Manny pulled down his scarf to fully reveal his upside down face. Sophie eyed them both with cautious optimism. You're, you're really magic? Yes, and we're from a place full of magic people. A place where people won't be scared of you, where you can have friends again, where you'll be safe and loved and learn how to become even better at magic. If you're really good, we might even... <coughs> Suddenly, a bullet whizzed through one side of Sophie and out the other. As her body hit the ground, all of her balloons floated away, her chocolate fountain ran dry, and the rain fell unhindered inside of the park. No! Icky screamed as she broke through the gates and rushed to Sophie's side, cradling her in her arms. Sophie! Sophie! Sweetie, wake up! Please wake up! Sophie! She applied her magic as best she could, but there was nothing she could do. Scoop her up and let's go. It's the GOC. We've got to get out of here. Icky glanced at the crumpled bullet on the ground and saw that it was silver-tipped beryllium bronze around a layer of telekill and an iron core, with warding microgrids engraved into each layer. It wasn't just the Global Occult Coalition, but the Ichabod Campaign. They had killed tens of thousands of reality benders over the decades, mostly like this. A sniper shooting down a child before they had any chance to fight back or grow up to become a serious threat. To become anything. Icky howled in rage. Pulling a tetherball post out of the ground for a weapon, she sped off in the direction the bullet had come from. Icky, no, it's suicide. Icky, damn it. As enraged as she was, she kept a clear head. She never ran straight for more than a couple of seconds and weaved behind any cover she could find. She couldn't manipulate those bullets with her telekinesis. If enough of them got inside of her, they'd impede her magic too much for her to heal. A single shot to the brain or heart would kill her for sure. Icky headed for the highest point along the bullet's trajectory, and on the top of a small hill, she saw the outline of 10 cloaked GOC strike team members, the rain giving away their position 
The sniper was still trying to get a lock on her, but the rest of them were clearly holding assault rifles at the ready. She pulled out her deck of trick cards and threw them all at the strike team before leaping down a manhole into the sewers. She knew their battle dress had the same reality anchoring and anti thaumaturgical protections as their bullets did, so she didn't aim for them directly. Instead, all 54 cards hit the pavement surrounding the strike team with so much kinetic energy that enormous amounts of concrete shrapnel went flying in all directions at deadly velocity. She heard the men screaming in surprise, pain, and then anger. She could hear one was hurt and barking orders at the rest, but she was willing to bet she'd incapacitated at least a few of them. They'd have their guns pointed at any manholes or sewerage grates around them, so she headed to the next manhole that still gave her a clear line of sight. She looked at it just a little and saw six remaining strike team members standing in a defensive back-to-back -back formation. She threw the manhole cover with so much force that it decapitated one of the gawkers and likely killed the team member directly behind him. She rapidly ducked under the gunfire of the remaining strike team but made no attempt to hide. After only seconds of running, the gunfire ceased, replaced by the sounds of empty magazines hitting the ground. Icky moved in for the kill. She struck the commander across the head with the tetherball post, scoring yet another decapitation. The last three reached for their sidearms, but she dropped to the ground and took out their legs with one sweep of the post. She impelled it through the chest of one of them, kicked off the head of another, and jumped onto the third, and began mercilessly pounding his head into ground beef with her fist. She screamed until there was no skull left and she was just punching the pavement. She hung her head and began to sob, but then heard a groan coming from behind her. One of the strike team members was still alive. His visor had been shattered and Icky could now see the man's eyes. One blue and one green. She pulled the tether ball post out of the corpse's collapsed chest and swung it at him. The moment it made contact, it turned to sand in her hand. Taken aback, she stepped away from the man, unsure of what just happened. The man took off his now useless helmet, shaking dust and sand out of his blonde hair. The two of them quickly became stained with crimson streaks, as the rain around them turned to blood and she had no doubt it was his doing. She lunged to tear out his trachea. Without moving, he shifted out of her path, as if he had never been there at all. With a single motion of his fist, he called down a bolt of lightning to end her for good. Icky merely spasmed with an illuminated skeleton and survived with nothing worse than some singed hair and clothes. Well, that's a first. What's it going to take to put you down this time? She charged at him again and slipped on the blood. It congealed around her and strapped her to the ground, constricting around her torso like an anaconda. She couldn't summon enough strength to break free, nor enough magic to overpower whatever it was he was doing to her. It was getting harder to breathe. Should have taken the bullet, sweetheart. This ain't going to be pleasant for both you and me. There was still one thing she could do. As much as she hated being a damsel in distress, it was definitely preferable to being dead. Hey, have you ever heard of the man with the upside down face at the Circus of the Disquieting? The man scoffed at the nonsensical question, but went pale as he recognized the feeling of something foreign probing around inside his mind. Hello, Francis whispered a voice with no actual sound. The man with the upside down face was inside his head, looking for anything that he could use against him, and it didn't take him long to find it. The man saw Lily, the goddess Francis lived in constant fear of. The man saw the constant disrespect, the unending criticisms, the vicious insults, all because he wasn't good enough for her. If he could just be the person she deserved, she would be nicer. He laughed. <laughs> The laughter of the man with the upside-down face echoed through Francis's skull. It was all he could hear. The man laughed at Francis's helplessness, at his weakness, at his failure at being a man. The man laughed at how pathetic Francis was beneath his tough guy facade. The man laughed and laughed and laughed, until in Francis's mind there was nothing else but the laughter and the deafening, ego-destroying thoughts. The rain had turned to water again. Icky was free, and the treacherous gawker had collapsed into a fetal position on the ground, rocking back and forth while clutching his head and sobbing, begging Lily not to hurt him. Icky moved in to finish him, but heard Manny's voice in her mind telling her to leave him be and run. As much as she hated to leave a gawker breathing, it was probably best to take her chance at escaping while she had it. 
She spat on him before she ran. Several hours later, Icky knelt over the shallow grave she and Manny had dug for Sophie in Mount Hood National Forest. She had transfigured a boulder into a proper tombstone. It read, Here lies Queen Sophie, age unknown but far too young, victim of the Ichabod genocide. May she find peace in what lies beyond, and may her loss forever remind us why we fight against the book burners. Sleep sweetly, your majesty. Icky wept. <laughs> Manny put his arm around her, wiping her tears as she laid his head up against him. It's a nice headstone. I'm sure she would have liked it. What about the gawker? He won't remember us. I took that away. But he was too powerful for me to do any lasting damage. I hope we don't ever cross paths with him again. He had some serious issues. I don't give a damn what his excuse is. He's a monster. Icky then let out an exhausted sigh. Thanks for saving me back there. I owe you one. You'd have done the same for me. We should get going. If we're not back at the circus soon, Stretchy might think something happened and start searching for us. We don't want to let them worry. Icky nodded softly. She kissed her fingers and touched them to the gravestone. The clown and the freak rose to their feet, leaving the swiftly yet lovingly made grave in peace among the dripping pine needles and gently falling rain.